Galatians chapter 4. And you'll find Galatians after the Gospels, Romans, Corinthians. you find Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, as says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. A little phrase I want you to think about and to remember, God sent forth his Son. Matthew chapter 22, first gospel. Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, the Lord Jesus is known as king. Luke's gospel, he's known as the man of, the son of man. Mark's gospel, the perfect servant. John's gospel, the son of God. Very important, unique, north, south, east, and west. Matthew 22, verse 1. And Jesus entered and spake unto them again by parables and said, and a parable is a, earthly story with a heavenly meeting, and the Lord Jesus often spoke in parables. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Very important phrase. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took their servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and went and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. Go ye, therefore, into the highways, and as many as ye find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered to gather all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. John's Gospel now and chapter 6. John's chapter 6. And we'll break in at verse number no, 16. I'm sorry. John chapter 16. I knew there was something wrong with the words when I looked at chapter 6. John chapter 16, and we'll break in here at verse number 7. <clears throat> John 16, verse number 7. Listen carefully to the word. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. The Lord Jesus is talking to his own disciples. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. And he's talking of the Holy Spirit. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. And ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Here be eth when he... This does he's talking of the spirit. The spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things 
to come. One other reading, and it's in 1 Thessalonians. And you'll find it a little farther over in your book here. Go past Galatians. And you'll come to Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. I want one verse of the 1 Thessalonians, and then the rest is in 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to gather with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the ear, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now led us will let until he be taken out of the way. And it's talking about the Spirit of God here. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders." and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they sh should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now God can add a blessing reading of his holy word, more important than what I can say about it, because that's what's important. The words that I read to you are inspired right from God in heaven himself. And it's important that you read it, that you know it. You owe it to yourself to have your own Bible and read your own Bible. You owe it to yourself to read these words. These are the holy words of God. I'll make it simple for you where you can under, you follow through tonight. I want to speak, first of all, of a son sent. Sent for his son. A son that was sent. And we want to talk about the coming of the Lord Jesus in Bethlehem and going to the cross. And then we want to speak about a, a, a sent for his servants. Servants that are sent. He sent his own disciples out. He told them, go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be there. He sent his own disciples out. And from that moment, there have been servants, those who are true believers. God has sent them out to proclaim and to tell the lovely story of the cross. The gospel means good news. Good news of deliverance. Good news of individuals that are born on the broad road, leading to death, in danger of hell and the lake of fire. They can be delivered. That's the good news. And it's all because of Christ coming to earth. And the servants goes out to tell this lovely news. That's why we're in Manitoba tonight. I wouldn't come to Manitoba for anything else. Really, not at all. If I wanted to go on a holiday, I'd go somewhere else, not Manitoba. Although there's nothing wrong with Manitoba. And I certainly wouldn't come in the wintertime at all. But listen, I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm here because there was a moment in my own experience when I learned the truth 53 years today. And it's not quite the time yet because it was 10 minutes before 11 that I, as a boy of 16, I learned the truth of why Jesus was sent from heaven and why servants came to the coast of Labrador and told the news of how sinners could be saved. And I heard that lovely news and I trusted the Savior and tonight I have everlasting life. But you know, not only was the son sent, and not only was the servant sent, but you know, we depend tonight on the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus taught his own disciples, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send a comforter. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And that's why every single person tonight is in this meeting, because of the Spirit of God. Ah, the Spirit has been dealing with you today, haven't he? 
I would like to think that there are children here and the Spirit of God has been speaking to you. You know that these verses that you memorize in Sunday school are not just verses from any book. It's verses from the Holy Bible. And you know they are important. And you know that you need to be ready to meet God. You know you need to prepare to meet Him. And you know it could be today that you need, you're going to meet Him. And you need to be prepared. Now, are you prepared tonight? If I asked each one of you, as you're moving out the building tonight, are you ready to meet God? Have you been born again? What would you say to me? What would you tell me tonight? I don't want you to answer me, but listen, it's important that you understand, you know, and you can. That's what the Bible teaches. You can know these things I write unto you that you might know that you have everlasting life. A lot of people, and certainly a lot of religions, and a lot of denominations, and all the, the na other names that you give to them, would tell you that you can't know that you're going to be in heaven. Listen, that's what the book is all about. You can know tonight, and 10 minutes before 11, 1969, as a boy, I come to understand that Jesus died for me and I knew I was saved. I knew I was going to heaven. And 53 years later, I haven't forgotten that I'm still going to heaven. You going? A son that was sent. Servants that was sent. And the Spirit of God came down to earth and he's convicting men and women, women of judgment and sin. That's why you feel bad when you sin, when you tell a lie, when you steal, when you cheat, when you do other things. You know, that's why, because the Spirit of God is there and He's dealing with you. And He reveals that truth to you. And that's why you're here tonight. The Spirit of God has brought you here. It says that he, it will unfold and tell you the truth. And it's the Spirit of God that will tell you the truth. The spirit of the one that went back to heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit. And we who are believers have the Holy Spirit. I saw a communist girl get saved in Russia. She was a communist teacher. A teacher who taught communists in school to the students. And you know, uh, something happened in her home one day. Her little girl came home from school and had trusted the Savior. And she hated God. She told other people there was no God. And she taught people there was no God. And for three years, every single day, she beat her daughter, trying to beat Christianity out of her little daughter. Ah, but her daughter got something that nobody else could give her. It was the Spirit of God that revealed to this little girl the truth of what Jesus did for her up on the cross and trusted the Savior. And, you know, finally the, the, the Spirit of God began to deal with this communist lady. She got a little scared. She loved her daughter and got a little scared that she was going to kill her daughter. And she said to God, she says, now, God, I've been teaching people there is no God. But somehow or another, my daughter has brought home the truth to me, and I have many big questions about God. If you're real, God, if you're real, and if there is a living God, make yourself known to me. And if you make yourself known to me, I will trust you. One day, the little girl came home from school. And, uh, you know, the mother told her she was going with, the, with her to the prayer meeting tonight. And she says, put you move. Why, mother? Why? She says, I've been asking the Lord to show me the truth. And if there's any truth, and if there's any God, and if he's real, and if he's alive, to make sure that he makes himself known to me. And he has. For three months, I haven't beaten you for one day. Have you noticed? She says only God could do that. And the mother went to the, went to the prayer meeting and trusted the Savior, and her life was changed. Why I told you that? That lady became our interpreter one trip to Russia. And in our teaching and in our preaching, 
She didn't know this, but in our, our preaching and teaching to people and to audiences, she learned that the moment she trusted the Savior, the Holy Spirit entered her body. That's the seal. That's the down payment from God that you belong to him. That's one of the reasons why you can never lose your salvation. So many people believe you can get saved, but you can lose it. No, my friend, you can't get saved, and therefore you can't lose it. That's one thing. But the very moment you trust the Savior, the Holy Spirit enters your body, and it claims you for God. It claims you. It's a down payment. It's a seal that you belong to his, and he will never, never, never leave you. I'll listen, that woman wrote me a letter, and she says, I've been lying in my bed for three days crying. I was a wicked, wicked, wicked woman. But he reached and saved me. Are you saved tonight? Or are you still a wicked woman? Or are you still a wicked man? Are you still in your sins, young boy? Listen, listen, you're on the broad road. You're on the broad road with the murderers. You're on the broad road with the idolaters. You're on the broad road with all the rest of earth. Yes, in a Christian home, sheltered, but you're still on the broad road and in danger of death. A lot of young people die. Fifteen years old. Young man is coming to a meeting in Newfoundland. Listening to the gospel every single night. Sitting in the front row with the others. But a little careless. Putting it off every night, thinking he got lots of time. And, you know, during the meetings, his buddies phoned up and says, can't we go to the drive-in and get a, you know, a hamburger? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with going to the drive-in and get a hamburger, sure. And they all get together. Four of them gets in the car, and the way they goes to the drive-in to get a hamburger. On the way, dear, they stopped. They just stopped and got out, walked around the car, talk, talked a little bit, and the boy on this side changed it to this side. And the boy on this side changed it to that side in the car. Well, it doesn't make any difference, does it? It doesn't make any difference until a car goes around a turn and hits a cement pole. And you're on the wrong side. And the young man is taken from a Christian home, ushered into eternity in a moment of time. Are you ready? Sent for his son, sent for his servant, sent forth the spirit of God to bring you under the influence and to convict you of your sin and to reveal the truth to you if you would ask him. Whosoever, two verses in the Bible says this, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever called upon the Lord? Have you ever called upon him, my friend? Oh, listen, you make a telephone call, and it's getting more now. You make a telephone call, and the, uh, the, not the man or the woman on the other end. It's a voice. It's just a, you know, a voice that they have punched in. And uh, if you want this, you punch one. You want that, punch two. You want that, punch three. You want this, punch four. And it goes on. Sometimes it goes up to seven, eight, and nine. And you forgot what you wanted, and you didn't know which number to punch anyhow. That's not our God, my friend. The very moment the soul would stop and consider his destiny and his direction, because direction determines destiny. Your direction that you're traveling determines your destiny, my friend. Decision determines destiny, too. And you can't, if you're on the broad road, it's important that you get up, but the very moment you stop, and consider and cry out to God. He'll answer you and he'll tell you exactly what you want to know. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. My verse from the other night, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there's none else. Very important that you respond. Because if you don't, Second Thessalonians says that if you don't believe the truth. And this is the truth. This is the truth. You understand? It's called a holy Bible. It's God's inspired word. It's God's word to all humanity. 
Everywhere you can preach it in the jungles of Africa and it's the truth there. You can preach it on the highlands of Venezuela and it's the truth there. You can go down and into the north of Siberia and it's the truth there, my friend. And you can go to the ends of the earth. It's still the truth. Do you know the truth? Then if you know the truth, why is it you haven't trusted the one who is telling you the truth? Because if you don't believe the truth, God is going to send a strong delusion and you'll believe the lie. There is a man coming. There is a man coming. And he will tell the world he is the Christ. But he's not the Christ. He is the Antichrist. And the people will believe him. And those that knew the truth and heard the truth right in the gospel hall like you from a Christian home who have heard it over and over again, a strong delusion and you'll believe the lie. What a thing. Is there anybody here in this present meeting tonight and you're in danger of getting this deception after the Lord comes? Now I have a few minutes and we'll conclude sent forth his son. The world has seen great episodes in humanity, special times of turning of all humanity. And if there was ever a time when all humanity was touched, it was when Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. The man... Christ Jesus, born into the world. Deity took on humanity to come down to earth that he might go to the cross and die for humanity. Christ died for us. God couldn't die. God is spirit. And in order for him to make that sacrifice for you and I, the human body had to be taken. And outside the city walls of Jerusalem, the body that he took was nailed upon Golgotha's tree. I was thinking about it today. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He, he, raised, he raised the dead. He did miracle after miracle after miracle. They should have known what it must have been like for the disciples just to be able to walk with him and talk with him. And he would say, I'm the Messiah. They knew he was. He was God. In human flesh. And he told them what he was going to do. He told them that he was going to go to the cross. He told them that he was going to die. He told them that, you know, that, that, that big separation in the tabernacle was going to be ripped from the top to the bottom. And that ripped open. And God himself was going to provide a way right into the very presence of God. That woman, communist lady. She says, I just couldn't comprehend that I was so wicked, but he cleansed all my sins away and made me pure. You know something whiter than the snow? The Bible talks about it. We who are cleansed by the blood of Christ, the Bible says we are whiter than the snow. Are you cleansed by the blood of Christ? Do you want to know him tonight? The one that was born in the city of Bethlehem, cradled in a manger, sent forth his son. Sent for the servant. My wife was working, was reading the missionary book to me today. You know, the man that was in, back in the 1870s. 1870s, bringing the gospel to Canada. Amazing. And the movements of the Holy Spirit. And how many servants has there been since back in the 1800s? Right up to our day, 2022. Servants are still sent out to proclaim this lovely message. Tremendous message you carry. How I count it a privilege. I sat in a Russian general home on his birthday once in Russia. Had a birthday party with him. I told him, I says, now listen, I, I want you to understand that God didn't just send me here to enjoy the cake that you have and a little birthday party. God has sent me here with a message, and I want to tell you that's this lovely message. And I told him how I got saved. Maybe I will too some night tell you how I got saved before we leave. 
Oh, listen, this is a marvelous thing to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. Servants sent out. The people would say in Ukraine and Russia, they would say, how come you come to my home? How come you come to my village? I didn't come. I was sent. I couldn't decide to come to you, wouldn't found you. I wouldn't have been able to find you if I tried, not at all. It was the Spirit of God that picked me up in Labrador, brought me across the ocean and brought me right to Moscow and through the wilderness here in Siberia and brought you right to my hole. One lady says, I don't believe in God and don't want to hear about him. I says, it's funny, very funny. I says, uh, I want you to understand one thing, that uh, God has an interest in you even though you don't have an interest in God. Because God has picked me up and brought me right to your home. And will you just allow me five minutes to tell, me to tell you the message that I have for you? And she wasn't going to first. And then she began to cry. Little tears came down her face. Five minutes to tell me. Listen, because God had an interest in her, even though she didn't have an interest in God. And listen, God has a real interest in you. Amazing. Some of you have been born into Christian homes. That's a great privilege. And he has sent many servants to you, many preaching the word. And he has sent the Holy Spirit to bring you right here tonight and have you to sit up nice and straight in your little seat and you're listening so well. We appreciate all the children who listen. Tremendous. The Spirit of God speaking inside here. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Remember, God said it, I believe it, and <laughs> settle, my friend, tonight. Because if you don't get a settle with God, you have a tremendous account with God, no matter how old you are. You don't have to commit a murder or a, rob a bank, you know, or do any of these things to go to hell. That's, that's not what takes you to hell. You're going to hell because who you really are. You are a sinner. And you, unless you're cleansed from your sin and unless God makes a new person out of you, that's why it's need to be born again. And if God doesn't make a new person out of you, you're finished. You're on the broad road and your destiny is sealed for eternity. There's only one person who can deliver and it's the Lord Jesus tonight. You're not saved before this meeting and you're still not saved and, and listening to what I have said. Listen to our brother Steve. Listen carefully. Don't miss a word. You can't afford to miss one word. Understand? You can't afford just to sit in your seat and, not, and miss one word of what he's going to say. Because the destiny, once you pass the column of death, I stood inside of my brother a day before his 19th birthday, and that's when he died in the city of Montreal. Whatever you do, Ronnie, whatever you do in these last moments you have here upon earth, make sure you trust the Savior because you only have a few more minutes left. And everything went haywire. The boy was gone. Very important. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Let's turn, please, in our Bibles. And I agree with my brother Eric tonight. You need to pay particular attention. When the word behold is used in the scriptures, I know some of the modern translations say look. That's not what the word means. We could be walking down the street and I say, oh yeah, look at that. And you take a quick glance. You say, wonderful, interesting. And you keep going. That's not what it means. Behold means to stop and gaze and consider. And that's what God says when he says behold. We're going to look at three scriptures, please. First, the book of Romans in chapter 3. Book of Romans chapter 3. Just three verses. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what thing soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, 
that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. John's Gospel, chapter 1, please. John, chapter 1. And verse 29. Very well-known verse. All three of these verses are very well-known verses. John, chapter 1, and verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Chapter 3, please. John chapter 3, another very well-known verse. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A woman named Carol Weiler, in 1998, had to go in for surgery to have a right eye surgically removed. You know, if anyone here, if you've ever had surgery, they'll often tell you now, as they turn on the drip, they tell you, I want you to count to 10. If there's anybody here who's gotten any lower than eight, that's a marvel. Because usually you'll wake up at some point and you'll look around the room and you'll say, when do we go in for surgery? And they'll tell you it's finished. They put you under. She went in to have her eye surgically removed in 1998 and she was put under. And all of a sudden, minutes later, she could hear dance music playing. The next thing she heard was cut deeper and pull harder. She said, I desperately wanted to scream. I wanted to lift my arm, move a finger, somehow, some way, signal to the doctor, I'm awake. But she couldn't. You see, she was what they call, they say one or two people in a thousand, they call it anesthesia awareness. And what happens is that they somehow become conscious while under an anesthetic, but they're paralyzed. They can't do anything. They can't communicate. She said she couldn't feel pain as they were doing the surgery. She just felt pressure. She said until they administered a drug, and she worded it like this. She said, it felt like ignited fuel just rushed through my body, and I was burning. And she began to think, maybe, maybe I've been wrong about my life. And I'm in hell. Maybe I've been wrong all these years about what I thought. I thought I had all sorts of time and I could plan life and I could live the way I wanted to and I'm in hell. That's what she thought. God forbid that ever happens to somebody here. That you might think you have days and months and weeks and years And like this man in Luke chapter 16, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Many people, when they tell their testimony, and I've heard it many times, they say, I was just like the prodigal, Luke chapter 15. I can't relate to that. Allow me to say that my experience in life was probably a little bit more, probably a lot more, like the man in Mark chapter 5 from Gadara. I was raised in a good home. My father was hardworking, probably the hardest working person that I know besides my own wife. And I grew up in a home where my father valued honesty and hard work above everything. He who worked during the day, came from another country, had to work hard to support four children, worked around the daytime, came home for supper, went back to work, and was often gone till one or two in the morning 
before he returned home again. My mother was God-fearing. Understand we had a Bible in our home, but we never read it. Understand my mother, back in the country where they came from in South America, my mother actually taught Sunday school, but did not know peace with God. We were raised in a home like that. My father played professional soccer in South America. Being athletic or playing sports, and it may not look as if I did now, <laughs> being athletic and playing sports was expected, and I played competitive soccer and hockey as I grew up. But by the time I got up into my teen years, because mathematics was not a strong point in school for me, I, I like reading, writing, grammar, all those things are fine. Numbers don't, they don't sit well with me. And so because of this, my mother gave me an ultimatum one year and said, if you're going to continue on these tournaments and you're going to continue playing competitive, you have to go to summer school and earn yourself better math scores. And so I did. When I was in Sunday school, at the age of 12, uh, summer school, I should say, at the age of 12, this is between grades 7 and 8, I met a young man there named Brad. He loved to hunt, he loved to fish, he loved the outdoors. And because of this, we, we just seemed to get along. It was like a glove fit. What I did not know is that his father walked out on his mother, who was an alcoholic, when he was a young boy, and it left him completely embittered, and he became a very violent young man. I didn't know those things. He was keeping company with some of the kids at the high school. They were using drugs on a daily basis. They were selling drugs, and they were committing crime in order to, uh, to fund their drug habits. I didn't know that. If you would have asked me, would you ever use drugs? Back then, I would have said, that's for weak-minded people. I have better control over myself. I don't see myself doing that. You want to throw your life away and be a loser, you go ahead. I won't be doing that. But pretty soon, I began trying some of the things that they were doing. Started going to some of the parties that they were attending. Understand, if you've met my boys, you've met Hayden and Henry... Henry's 15 years old and is six foot four. Well, I'm not six foot four by any stretch of the imagination. But as a 12-year-old boy, I was a lot taller than most kids my age. And because of that, I was accepted by the high school crowd as being older or at least more in their range. At 12 years old, it began with drinking alcohol sometimes, trying that. My friends got me to try smoking. They began to, uh, to get me to smoke marijuana and things like that. All those things that are really just the beginning of a downward spiral. By the time I was 13 years old, things progressed from bad to worse. I began using much more powerful drugs. I began selling drugs at the age of 13. How many people do you know in grade 8 that sell drugs? That's the kind of life that I had at that age. By the age of 13... I started small, and things just got worse and worse and worse. And although throughout my teen years I tried to reform, there were times I even went to Florida for the months of June, July, and August because I thought if I just get away from these people, they're dragging me down. I thought if I just get away from them, then I'll be able to turn over a new leaf. Things will get better. But what I didn't understand was the power that sin began to have in my life. I, you know, if I think of the Proverbs, chapter 5 and verse 22 tells us that his own iniquities will capture the wicked and he will be held with the cords of his sin. Young boys and young girls in the meeting tonight, you be absolutely certain that before tonight is over, you know, the temptation is to say in these meetings, get God's salvation. No. Before tonight's over, get God's salvation. God doesn't promise you another moment. In fact, let me just give you an idea of some of my friends, just to tell you about these people who died tragically in their teenage years. Some of them uh, before they were 17 or 18 years old. I had a friend named Ken, Ken Hashi. He had a motorcycle, bought it at 16 years old took a spare class with another friend of ours who had a motorcycle as well, and they decided that they were going to drive up and down Winston Churchill Boulevard, probably an 80, 70 or 80-kilometer speed limit on this road. 
And there had been construction that had been done on that road. They were repaving. And the sewer lids just happened to uh, be protruding a bit. They weren't, they weren't smoothed over. And they were going a very fast speed when he hit a sewer lid like that. And his bike began to wobble and he tried to brake hard and his brakes locked and he went into a speed wobble and he hit a cement hydro utility pole doing over 100 kilometers an hour at the age of 16. You see this pillar here? There's no age on that pillar. There are people who breathe their first breath and go into eternity. There are people who are three or four years old and end up with cancer and go into eternity. There are children, the age of the one sitting right in front of me, who go into eternity, unexpected. I remember sitting at his funeral, looking at his face. I don't know how they ever had an open casket funeral for him, but I'm going to say this. I remember looking at his form, first funeral I'd ever been to, and... and that gray form that looked like an empty shell, I could not describe it. Could not understand it. I couldn't take it in. But I understood something's different. He's not here. And I thought, if this were me, where would I be? I had another friend named Rhonda Jackson who was drinking and using drugs. And they went to a party, her and her boyfriend. They got in a big fight when they got back. She dropped him off and pulled into her garage and shut the door and sat in her car and did not turn off the ignition. And before long, she was in eternity, 17 years old. I had a young man that I used to play competitive soccer with named Rohan. And I remember a friend of mine telling me, did you hear what happened today? It was on a Saturday afternoon. I said, no. He said he got into a, a, a drug deal uh, where somebody, he, somebody tried to steal his drugs and there was an altercation and the person pulled out a gun and shot him point blank range right in front of a busy shopping center on a Saturday afternoon. And he died. A good friend of mine, Heather, I knew her from about the age of 11 or 12. Driving home one night, now she's 22 years old, she's driving home at about 2 o'clock in the morning on Highway 403 going through Mississauga, heading west to her home. All of a sudden, a transport truck coming the other way, tire comes off, careens across the middle, hits her car, and rips that car into two, and she goes immediately into eternity. I remember that funeral. Her mother collapsed on the casket and was weeping. Here's a young girl who had a life planned ahead of her. And in a moment, unexpected, unexpected. Not even something she could avoid for it happened too quick and she's gone into eternity. And dear soul in the meeting tonight, that vehicle which brought you here tonight, you could be heading home on the highway. And unbeknownst to you is someone texting or not paying attention or had been driving too long and falls asleep and crosses the median, hits your car head on, and you'll go into eternity. And where will your soul be five minutes after you die? Those things had impressions on me. Job chapter 14 and verse 10, man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? Where will your soul be five minutes after you die? Throughout those years, God spoke to me many times. However, as soon as I would begin to think soberly, I would start thinking to myself, Steve, you're just getting yourself worked up. Just go to the party and forget about all of it. And enjoy yourself and get past that. Relax. And just then, Satan would rob me of the arrows of conviction. You know, I've seen children, uh, teenagers, people of all ages, after a gospel meeting, walk out of the meeting not saved, laughing, telling jokes, enjoying themselves. And I think to myself, oh God, have mercy on them. Have mercy on them and make it real that they could die in their sins tonight and they'll be in hell. God, wake them up. I hope that doesn't happen to you tonight, dear friend. 
The Bible says, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. I remember one time I got pulled over with some friends. A friend of mine said to me, he said, Steve, and he was a drug dealer as well. He said, Steve, I've got 5,000 LSD tablets. I want you to understand something. That's, that's a, a tremendous amount. He said, Steve, I need you to take this. The police are looking for me. I need you to take it from point A to point B. I said, well, I don't know. That's a bit risky. He said, you do that, I'm going to give you, reward you handsomely. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I got into a car. We're driving along down the road, and little did I know that they had an expired sticker on the plate. I heard they're getting rid of that in Ontario. Happy about that. Some stickers. But anyhow... We got pulled over, and all of a sudden, the policeman was talking to the driver, and he looks at the passenger, and the passenger takes something out of his pocket drugs and puts it in his mouth to swallow it. The policeman jumped over the hood of the car, grabbed him by the throat, and pulled him out of the car to attempt to choke it out of his throat. And I'm sitting in the back with 5,000 tablets of LSD. I'm saying, oh, God. Don't let me be caught with this. This is going to be a long prison sentence if I am. And they took everybody out of the car and they began to strip search everybody. And then another police car comes and another police and another and another. And I'm at the end of the line being waiting to get searched. And a man comes out of the one of the police cars with the stripes on his arm, sergeant or whatever he is. And he comes walking over to me for whatever reason and says, come with me for a minute. I need to ask you some questions. He said, what happened tonight? So I told him the story. I just honestly told him what I observed. And I said, I'm just getting a ride with these guys. I'm not even close friends with them. Another policeman that does all those searches comes over and says to the sergeant, he goes, what about this man? He said, I've got him, he's okay. Can I tell you my heart nearly sunk? I thought I was going to prison for a long time. And I don't know what would have come from that. But let me just say this, I had many close calls. I almost overdosed. I remember going to a party and a young man was pacing up and down using crack cocaine up in the upper floor. And all we heard was a thud. Nobody knew what happened. They just heard a thud. And so one of his friends went up to see what was going on. He collapsed into a closet and went to cardiac arrest and died and died. I remember leaving and it was probably minus 25. My heart was going into these funny rhythms and felt like my heart was skipping beats and I couldn't breathe and I was starting to pour sweat and my face was beat red. I thought I was overdosing. I went out in about minus 25 weather and paced around a park for about an hour. I said, God, please don't let me die. Please spare me. I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to meet God. What about you? Well, you say, I've never used those drugs, so I'm not in the same place you were in. Friend, it's the same hell, okay? We're cut from the same cloth. My brother Eric, I agree with him wholeheartedly. What you are is far worse than anything you've ever done. And it was the same with me. I paced that park and I pled with God and God spared me. I remember when I got up into my 20s, God began to have very distinct dealings with me. I couldn't go to a nightclub and enjoy it anymore. I'd go to downtown Toronto nightclub in a very bad area. And I remember the music would be pounding and people would be dancing and there was marijuana smoke and everything. And I would become, all of a sudden, I would just sober up for a moment and I'd look around and I'd think there's something very evil or wrong about this place. I began to see things a little bit more for what they are. Not only that... I remember sitting on the 28th story of, an, of a condominium overlooking the city of Mississauga. Parents were both away, and my friends had left, and I sat on the balcony for the first time, and I looked out into the city, and I, I said, God, I know you exist. I know there's a God out there. Would you speak to me? Would you show yourself to me? I'm living in total misery. I don't know what to do. I would have as some of my friends did, thought of taking my own life. But having my parents who were God-fearing people, I understood there's a heaven and a hell. 
and I knew if I died, I could be in the ladder. And I cried and pled with God. During this time, I didn't know. There was a young man named Chris who was probably the fiercest person I knew in Mississauga. I remember one day in southern Mississauga by Lake Ontario, I was walking down Lakeshore Boulevard, and there was a, there was a bar on the corner, and I, saw, I heard this commotion. And it's Chris Paisley, and the people, uh, there's four or five policemen, and they're trying to tackle him down, and they're trying to punch him, and he's punching them back. He's giving them a really good run for their money. He was a fierce person. Anytime he saw another guy named Kevin Zita, who was a, uh, ended up becoming a Hells Angels biker, anytime they saw each other, the first thing they did is take their coats off and they fought. They were bad news. This young man was in reform school as a young man, and as he got older, he ended up in and out of prison. I knew him because I used to sell drugs to him as a teenager. He sat in prison one day. He thought, at some point I should just finish, end my life. It's going nowhere. I can't go back out in the streets. I don't even know how to, how to live out there. He asked the prison warden, can I have a Bible? I heard you, you guys have Bibles you give to people. So he got his hands on a Bible. He began reading the scriptures in a prison cell. One day he's reading the words, Jesus knowing their thoughts said. And he said, what kind of person knows people's thoughts? How's that possible? So he continued reading. When he was released from prison, he was invited out by Dean Omard, who was in fellowship with Mimico, the Mimico Gospel Hall, Mimico Assembly. Dean knew that he'd have been in prison, and he asked him to come out to a gospel meeting. So Chris went. He obliged. He said, I don't remember who the first speaker was, but I can't forget the second. It was Albert Hall. He said, Albert Hall was crystal clear that if I left that meeting, and by the result of either an accident, an aneurysm, my heart stopping, Whatever the case, if I go into eternity the way I am, as sure as he is standing at this pulpit, my soul will be in the fire of hell. He said that that was it. He left that gospel meeting trembling. He went downtown Toronto, young and Dundas, right downtown, and paced up and down until almost 3 o'clock in the morning, in despair, crying out to God for mercy. And he said, just a handful of words just flooded into my soul around 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, Christ died for the ungodly. And he said, it dawned upon me, if he died for the ungodly, he died for me. And he said, I'm going to trust him right here on Young Street. And he did. And he brought the gospel to me. Well, let me just say this. First time he came to me, he said, Steve, have you ever been in a gospel meeting? I said, I've been to Mass. Yeah, sure. He said, oh, no, no, this is far different. He said, would you come? I said, of course I will. Now, you have to understand something. Up until that point, my friends, because here is a man who's violent, who's a drug addict, who's in and out of prison, and now all of a sudden, he's carrying around a Bible he looks like he's in his right mind. Well, maybe not to my friends. But he's walking up and down the street singing hymns. And they said, he's gone crazy. Don't talk to him. Avoid him like the plague. He's joined a cult. And through Satan, I believed him. I believed him. And I avoided him like the plague. I'd be downtown Toronto. I'd see him walking through a huge crowd. And I'd, I'd go into a store. Put my head in a magazine. He'd just come into the store and he'd say, Steve, I, hey, Steve, I was just praying about you. I'd be walking down the, or in a bus in Mississauga and he gets on at the stop and I'd sit there with my head down hoping he doesn't see me. And he comes down, sits beside me and turns and goes, oh, Steve, he says, I was just praying for you last night. I'm in an H&R blocks uh, getting my taxes done. And uh, I'm with a friend of mine. And the makeshift walls, he comes in. All I see is a person's head peek up over the wall. He must have heard my voice. He said, Steve, I was just praying for you. 
I turned to my friend and I said, don't you swear, this man's a Christian. He asked me countless times to come out to the gospel. And I wanted to go. I can tell you that with a true heart tonight. I wanted to go. I knew that I had no hope. And I wanted to go. But I would always make up an excuse. I can't really put the miles on my dad's car. I've got a place to be. I'd make up all these excuses. But every time I saw him, he'd buy me a drink. He'd take me out for lunch. He was always doing something kind. Another thing. When we sat up at 5 o'clock in the morning after a nightclub, my friends and I, and it began to be sober, and we started to talk about what happens after you die, my friends had all these crazy ideas. You're reincarnated. You float around in some kind of liquid. All this crazy stuff. They asked me, Steve, what do you believe? I said, well, I know there's a heaven and a hell, and I never want to be in hell. And they'd all laugh. They'd all burst out laughing. You know what was different about him? Every time I saw him, he opened the scriptures. He'd say, read this. And it was crystal clear. Young men and young women in the meeting tonight, can I tell you that we are so privileged to hold a book that people have been burned to death to preserve. And we have so many of them. Do we value God's word? He opened the book. And it just convicted me. I felt like I was sinking in my chair every time I read a verse. And I said to him, one day I said, I will go. And I went. He sat there. The other speaker sat there. I sat right in between. I thought that was quite normal. Well, one of them opened the Bible. The other one preached. And then they switched roles. And I would read from the other person's Bible. And the meanwhile, we're in the gospel meeting. I'm a drug addict and a drug dealer and a reprobate in many ways. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I like my friends out there. I'm here in a church and I'm singing these beautiful songs with these nice looking people. And I'm walking out the door like the Pharisee in Luke 18, thinking that I've got a bit of an advantage over the rest of my friends. They're riffraff. The man at the door said, what'd you think of the meeting tonight? I said, it was nice, very nice. That broke the heart of the friend, Chris, that brought me out. We got in the car and we drove and he said, Steve, pull over. I said, okay, I'm not going to say no to him, <laughs> not from the way he was before. We pulled off the road. I said, what's up? He said, Steve, if we get in an accident and die, what will happen to your soul? Where will you be? You ever thought of that? I said, well, Chris, you know me. I said, I've never murdered anybody. I said, I, I try not to cheat too much. I said, I, I lied only when necessary. I'm making all these excuses. He said, what if God told you? Oh, if God told me, I'd be a fool to, to not to listen. You believe this is God's word? Oh, I said, I know it is. It's the Holy Bible. He turned to Romans chapter 319, what we just read. Actually, I read from verse 10. As it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. He went right down the indictment against the human race. Verse 19, every mouth stopped, all the world guilty before God. I said, Chris, it, it was an awakening. If I die like this, I will be in hell. He gave me his Bible. He marked out pages, John 3 and 16, a number of verses. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. I'm sorry for going a few minutes over. Let me say this. I went home that night, Sunday evening. I read from Sunday to Tuesday, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I began reading in Deuteronomy. And it deepened my guilt. It didn't help me reading through the law. This made me feel my guilt so much deeper. He called me on Tuesday and said, come to a Bible study. Well, they turned it into more of a gospel meeting. That night I went home and I just thought I need to be honest with God for the first time. And I poured my heart out to God. God, I'm perishing. God, I need salvation. Oh God, I don't know how to be saved. I opened the book to where he actually marked some of the verses. And I came to what we read tonight, John chapter 1 and verse 29. John seeth Jesus coming and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And for the first time, I understood that includes all of my sin, all of them, 
Not one of them remains if he took them away. And I thought, if he died for me, I will trust him right now. Can I tell you what happened? He broke the power of sin. My drugs were flushed. My alcohol was flushed. My vile CD collection I destroyed. Because I knew I can't go back to that vile nonsense. I have something far better than what this world could ever offer. But I thought, how would I, what would I tell someone if they asked me, how do you know you're saved? And I continued to read. And I got to John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, have everlasting life. I said, there it is. God says it. I'm simple enough tonight to believe it. And that settles it. What about you tonight? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says, thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank thee for this privilege to speak a little about the saving grace and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that brought him to Calvary. We pray it might be a blessing to each one here tonight. If there are some that are not saved, oh God, help them to tremble and understand their need that they might come to him. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Thank thee for him in his name. Amen. We're just going to sing one verse, and I do did go over, and I acknowledge that. Just one verse in the chorus of a hymn, and we'll close it up. 194. 194. And I'm going to take the assumption that somebody here tonight is going to be honest with God. You're going to be honest about your need. Take the place of a sinner. So we'll sing verse 3. While the door of his mercy is open to you, ere the depth of his love you exhaust, won't you come and be healed? Won't you whisper, I yield? I have counted. I have counted the cost. Verse 3 and the chorus of 194.